team Adulam, welcome. Uh, we are now on our fifth edition of the Joshua series. Right, CK? Week five? Um, I hope you guys have been watching it and been super blessed. If you have, please share the sermons with your friends. Uh, so today we'll be looking at Joshua 2 yet again. And uh, right now specifically we'll be looking from Joshua 2, 8 to 21. All right. So I have CK, my audience, with me. <laughs> um, now, before I read it, before I read Joshua 2, 8, 21, uh, just to give a bit of a context around what's happening so that, you, you know, you're able to follow through. So what happens is that Joshua has sent two spies from Shittim um, to go and spy out the Jericho. And the reason why they're going to spy out Jericho is because Jericho is the first conquest. Soon, as soon as they cross the Jordan, Jericho is the first place that they're going to go and hit, right? Um, and so what happens is that this, these, these spies go into Jericho and they go hide um, in a, a, a lady's house. Her name is Rahab uh, and she's a prostitute. So she, they, go, they go to her house <laughs> to hide. <laughs> ah, to hide. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So they go to Rahab's house and... Uh, um, what Rahab does is that, what happens is that the king of Jericho finds out that they, um, gets a report that there are some guys who have come to spy out the land and they are in Rahab's house. So they go and send a message to Rahab like, yo, bring out where are the guys that, um, those, where are the spies? And, and so what she does is that she ends up protecting the spies and sending the king's men on a wild goose chase, right? Um, but the men are actually hidden in, in, inside her house. And so this is where this begins, this scripture begins, okay? Cool. All right, let's read it. Verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, and whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth, and spare my father and mother and my brothers and sisters with all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you, if you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on, a, uh, on the city wall, so that, she, uh, so that she was living on the wall. She said to them, Go to the hill country so that the pursuers will not happen upon you, and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterward you may go on your way. The men said to her, We shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down. And gather to yourself into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. And it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. And we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from the oath which you have made us swear. She said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the title of today's sermon, I actually have a title. I, I keep forgetting to, <laughs> to mention the title of my... But the title of today's sermon is, Whose Side Are You On? Whose Side Are You On? And one of the things that I love about this, um, this, this chapter, it's, it's, it's probably for me one of the most beautiful um, chapters uh, in the Bible because, you know, the chief protagonist in this, in this, in this chapter is a prostitute named Rahab, Right? A prostitute named Rehab, and you know the thing is that there's such, it's 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 you know one of the things that I, I always uh, believe is that you know is to find Jesus in the Old Testament because all the scriptures in the Old Testament are really about Jesus, right? And there's no 
this, this chapter is such a Jesus chapter, right? It really reveals Christ Jesus and it really points to, to Jesus who then comes thousands of years later, right? But this verse really, really speaks to that. Now, in the story of this Rahab, where first and foremost, Rahab is a Canaanite. So she's not an Israelite. So meaning the Canaanites are the ones that the Israelites are going to destroy. Okay? So she's a Canaanite, right? And then on top of that, <laughs> she's not only just a Canaanite, she's a prostitute. Are we together? CK. So she's a prostitute, all right? Now, meaning that this, this babe right now is literally on the path towards destruction, right? From a, from a literal sense in the sense that in just a few days, the Israelites are about to come and destroy Jericho. But then also, also her lifestyle, <laughs> right? Her sinful lifestyle. Do you get what I'm saying? Meaning that this, 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 this lady is solidly in the path of destruction, right? And um, the thing that happens is this, is that her life is literally transformed through an interaction with a couple of spies, okay? So these spies had been sent by Joshua, okay? They'd been sent by Joshua. The thing that's also really cool is that the name Joshua is, is also the, in Hebrew is the name Yeshua, which is the name of Christ, which is basically the, the God who saves, right? Just interesting point for you to note over here, just as you go along. And so the thing is, Joshua sends the spies from Shittim to go and spy out the land. Now, the thing is that's interesting is that even before we go deeper, you know me, I'm a teacher, yeah? I'm about the teaching the word. Now, the thing that's so interesting is that I don't think there's any coincidence, right, that these spies are from Shittim, right? In Numbers 25, we learn about how the children of Israel, while they were in the wilderness, begin to have sexual relations with the Moabite women, right? And so, the, 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 and that what really wasn't the scandal. The, the scandal wasn't just the fact that they were, that they were sleeping with these Moabite women who are here were very beautiful. Right? <laughs> right? So it's just like these guys are just, they are like, my guy, these babes, they are two tops, right? So it's not just the fact that they, were, that they were having sexual relations with them, but the thing was is that they, these, these women began to lure the Israelites into idol worship, and specifically worship of Baal, right? And so what happens is this, is that one of the things that you realize is that whenever the children of Israel would engage in idol worship, that God would basically tell them that they have begun to prostitute themselves, right? That they are playing the, the harlot, right? And so I don't think that there's any coincidence, right? I see that there's, there's something in here, and, and let's just, just work with me, right? In terms of that the spies that are being sent are spies that are being sent from a place that was literally a place where the children of Israel stumbled into idol worship, into prostituting themselves, into idolatry, right? Playing the harlot, right? And this is where these spies are from. Now, here's the thing. So these spies come through to go to there, to go to a prostitute's house, right? Now, this prostitute, what, she, what happens is this, is that the, the king of Jericho sends a message. He's, he's like, yo, I hear these guys are in your house. And now what happens is this, think about it. This is, this is Rahab the prostitute, and she's getting a message from the king of Jericho. Right? The king is, telling, is asking her, where are these guys? And at this moment in time, at this very specific moment in time, Rahab makes a choice. Right? And the choice that she makes is that she decides to disobey her king on account of another king. So what happens is, is that literally in this moment, Rahab, the prostitute, changes allegiance. She basically changes sides. She's like, me, I'm not trying to be with these guys anymore. I want to be with your God. Now, here's the thing. It says here that she had heard of the God of the spies, right? She had heard of the things. We talked about this last, uh, the last time. Right? She had heard of all the things that this God was doing. The Red Sea, 
the killing of the, 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 the kings and kingdoms that were greater than Jericho. Right? And so she's heard about this, this God and she even proclaims and she begins to declare this very powerful message. It's almost like she's preaching to these guys. She's just like she tells them, man, the Lord, your, your God, the Lord, your God, he is God of heaven above and on earth beneath. Right? And so after that, she proclaims, she's just like, my guy, me, <laughs> that God of yours, that's the one that I have, I literally made a decision to stand with by protecting you guys and leading those guys into a wild goose chase. So she makes a choice at that point in time to go with this God of heaven and earth. And so she then begins to ask these guys, she's like, yo, now that I've shown you this kindness, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me and my family. And so what happens is that the spies tell her, they're like, yo, you protected us. Here is a scarlet thread, right? That I want you to tie on your window. And when you tie this scarlet thread on your window and you go and you get all your family together, you tell them to enter into this place. Because if the thing happens in this place, when we come and we see that scarlet thread, you will be protected, right? Now, because of the decision that she made, Right? She escapes death. And what goes on to happen after that is that what's interesting is that even as a segue is that the scarlet thread is really the introduction of Jesus into the story. Right? And because of the decision that she makes to change sides, she finds herself protected by the scarlet thread. She finds herself under God's grace. She goes and she finds mercy for her and her whole entire family, right? And so what happens is that literally, if you go to um, uh, um, Joshua 6, is now where you see Jericho being now the downfall of Jericho, right? And what happens is, is that it says in the Bible that on that day when the conquest happens, that her and her whole family and everything that she possesses is then taken out of Jericho. And so what happens is that now she's standing on the side of Israel, watching as the city is burning down, watching as everything that she knew, the house, remember she lived on the wall, watching as the life that she knew goes up in flames. Right? And now what happens is this, eh? <laughs> the one that she says, the Lord your God, the God of the spies now becomes the Lord her God. And the reason why this happens is because of a choice that she made, of a decision that she made. To be, I am with, the, I'm with you guys. Me, I'm with you guys, right? And that's the decision that she made. Now, the thing that would be, that's so interesting is that she manages through this, this whole process to be able to save the life of her family and to save her own life. And I'm telling you, if the story ended there, it would have been a fantastic story, right? Great story. We love the story of Rahab. What a story of great redemption. My goodness. But you know what's so interesting about Rahab? Her story does not just end there. Do you know that God does not just end her story by delivering her from death. If you go on and you begin to read the story of Rahab, you begin to see how God literally rewrites her whole life. Rahab the prostitute, right, which was her identity that she saw burning up, that was the place where she did her craft, right, and she saw it burning up, Rahab the prostitute. She then, when she joins the community of Israel, she marries a guy called Salmon. Salmon is like the fish. Yeah? That's how you spell it, like the fish, right? Rahab and Salmon become the parents of Boaz. I don't know if you've read the story of Boaz and Ruth. You need to go and read that story, right? And the thing that happens is, is that she, if you go look at Matthew chapter 1, when you go and you literally start the Gospels, and the people who are doing the 30-day Gospel Challenge will know this, is that when you go and you read the account and the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you see Rahab mentioned 
as one of the champions of faith in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This woman, who is the great-grandmother of David the king, right? Rahab the prostitute, not only through that choice, redeemed her life. She literally changed her entire destiny from one decision that she made. And God literally begins, not only did he save her from death, but begins to rewrite her entire story to the extent that she becomes the great-grandmother of David the king, and on top of that, becomes a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and is mentioned as one of the champions of faith. If you go read Hebrews 11, when they're giving an account of all the champions of faith, right? There are many champions, but this one is like, these are the, like, the MVPs, right? These are like the, the MVP category. Rahab is literally mentioned as one of the champions of faith. And yet, the only, things that we, the only thing that we know about her life is that she made a decision. We don't know about any other decisions that she made. We only know about that decision that she made that literally altered her entire life. Rahab the prostitute goes from being Rahab the prostitute to being Rahab the champion of faith, the mother of Boaz, the grandmother of David the king, and a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the savior of all humanity. This is the story of Rahab. And you know the thing is, is that, okay, cool story, bro. We love, we love the story of Rahab. What am I saying here? Whenever we think about the word repent, is that we always imagine that repentance is really about stopping to do bad things. But actually, repentance is exactly what Rahab did. Repentance is making a choice. Repentance, literally the word, means to turn around. It means that I was looking in this direction and I begin to turn around. In fact, the word in Greek, repent, is a word that was used in military circles, where basically it was the, the tantamount to a soldier marching in one direction and doing an about turn. Wow! That is repent, right? And what happens is this, is that because of Rahab and the decision that she makes, it literally completely alters her life and sets in motion a series of events that completely change her life because of her choosing, repent, turning around. And the thing is, is that, you know, the thing that I, I realize is that for a lot of people, whenever they think about this idea of turning to God and repenting, is that they always think of it in terms of what are the things that I need to stop doing? What are the things that I need to do? I need to do, I need to. And yet, literally, what God was saying with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the ministry of repentance is turn around. Turn and face a different direction. Turn and face me. Turn and face me. Move from your back facing me and turn around and face me. And now here's the thing, is that if you bring it into this context, it's basically God saying that Stop rejecting me and turn towards me. It's not about stopping to do certain things. It's about turn towards me. Turn towards me. Now, in the story of Rahab, she makes a choice that changed her entire life. Right? As far as we know, this is the only choice that she made. She literally casts her hope in the God of Israel. She casts her hope. And thereafter, what God does is that he enrolls her Right? He enrolls her in an epic life of transformation that he begins to write on account of a decision that she made. Right? And so, she decided to choose God. That's all she did. That's literally all she did. Is she decided to choose God. And like, the thing for me is this. Is that if God is able to do this for a prostitute named Rahab. He will do it for us. He did it for a murderer in Moses. He did it for a murderer in David and Paul. 
He did it for a corrupt man named Luke. He did it for a lowly fisherman named Peter. Literally, God will take a repentant heart and begin to set in motion complete transformation. And all this on account of turning to him. It's just about changing sides. Literally, God is not interested in using perfect people. God is interested in using repentant people. People who literally turn their hearts towards him. It's not about perfection because God does not use perfect people. He uses broken, repentant people and begins to perfect them. And so what happens is this, is that what we see here is that God begins to set in motion a process of transformation in this woman's life. And he literally comes and begins to battle and transform and change her. And here's the thing why I'm talking about this is because one of the things that you'll realize, and we had this discussion, is that when you make a decision to follow Christ, what happens is this, is that suddenly, all of a sudden, there's certain things that begin to make you feel uncomfortable. There are certain battles that begin to be waged inside of you. All of a sudden, you're just like, man, like, there's this thing that I used to do, and all of a sudden, I feel really uncomfortable about it. And the thing that's so interesting is, is that literally, if you look at um, uh, what I love, the, the way I want to contrast this is that it's, it's, it's similar to what happens in John chapter 2. So in John chapter 2, what happens is this, is that um, Jesus is chilling, he's doing his thing, and he goes into... Um, Capernaum, right? And then what happens is this, is that he goes into the temple, right? And when he goes into the temple, he's so enraged. And he begins, it says, I love it, how it says, that he goes and he makes a whip. A whip. This is Jesus. Out of cords. And then what he does is, right? He starts to kick out all the animals, the money changers, and he starts to overturn tables. He goes ape nuts. Like, he's just like, He's just there whipping things, upset. And it says there that if you look at John 2, it says that he is so upset. He's like, I do not want, how, why are you making this into a marketplace? Right? This should be a house of worship. This should be a house of worship. And he begins to whip. And then it says there that the, that the disciples recognize that this is actually based on what it says in the scriptures. That my devotion to your house, O God, burns in me like a fire. And the thing is that happens is that in that same chapter, when you begin to see this, this very literal sense of what Jesus does when he gets into the temple and the stuff that's happening in there that displeases him, he begins to go into a complete rage and kick things out of this place, right? But the thing that's interesting is that if you go right below that, the, the, the Pharisees come and they ask him, what makes you think that you have the right to come and do such a thing in the temple? And he says to them, if you, I will destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. And they're like, what? So then they are thinking he's talking about the literal temple. But it says in the scripture that actually he was talking about his body. Right? And that makes you realize that what he's doing in John 2 is very symbolic of what he does when he comes into your temple. When we make a decision to turn towards him, that guy comes in with a whip <laughs> and he begins to remove all the things that should not be there. And that's part of the reason why when you become a believer, all of a sudden there's things that you battle with that you like that never used to concern you. There were things that you never used to care about, but then all of a sudden you feel uncomfortable about certain things. You feel uncomfortable about certain conversations. You feel uncomfortable about being certain, around certain, certain, certain people, you know, and all of a sudden things begin to start feeling like, and so for us, we begin to start wondering, man, I feel so guilty. I feel so bad, but not realizing that this is what happens when Jesus comes into the temple. He comes and he begins to whip things out of your life. Right? Why? Because it says here that the zeal and the devotion to his house, oh God, it burns in him like a fire. 
Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That you no longer belong to yourself. Now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And now because you have made a decision to follow with Christ, he begins to come and start executing his will and his whip. He comes to kick out all the crazy animals <laughs> and the love of money and the money changes and begins to overturn things in your life. And all of a sudden you begin to start feeling uncomfortable about certain things. This is the work of your Savior. And all this on account of a decision that you've made to turn towards him. This is literally Rahab preaching the gospel. That because of the decision that she made, her life is drastically changed. Not because of anything, but because of that decision. And it's the same thing. The God of Rahab is our God. If you have accepted him into your life, Hey, my friend, you're waging a war. Because when he comes in, he begins to clean up his temple. You know, one of the things that's so interesting is that um, in, 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 in John 6, um, 28 to 29, there's, there's the Pharisees who come and they begin to have a conversation with, with Jesus. And... Um, one of the things that they do is that they, they observe him and they, they begin to ask Jesus, what must we do in order to do what God wants us to do? Right? They're like, tell us, what must we do? And you know what Jesus responds to them in verse 29? He says to them, what God wants you to do is to believe in the one he sent. That's it. And you know when you read that, you look at that and you're like, I'm sure those guys must have been like, yeah, 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 but like what else? <laughs> you know, it's like, so like what else are we meant to do? Like it's like, should we, should we? And he's just like, no, believe in the one that he has sent. Why? Because that's the thing that sets in motion the transformation that you need in your life. And so the thing that saddens me so much, CK, is because I see so many believers burdened by so many things that they that that they ought to do shouldn't do hey, all that stuff like we are so burdened by so many things that we feel like we ought to be doing and we don't recognize that literally the most important thing and the thing that sets in motion the transformation of our lives is merely literally turning to him and when we do, when we repent and we turn our hearts towards him, he then begins the process of transformation in our lives. And it's progressive. If you read the story of Rahab, if you left it at the end of Jericho, you'd have missed it. But you didn't realize that God had great plans, that he was not going to leave Rahab as Rahab the prostitute. He goes on ahead to completely alter her identity. And now she stands in history as part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, a champion of faith, all because she repented, she turned and began to face him. My goodness, why don't we have patience? Why don't we allow God to transform us? If you remember the story that I shared with you about the uh, it's actually a story in uh, let's it's it's a story in first samuel if you remember the story that i shared with you where even in regards to how we overcome the idols in our lives you know we are getting caught up and we're like you know serve the lord your god with all your heart with all, and we are caught up in this thing for like all oh, the idols if you remember the story of first samuel 5 where it says that the ark of the covenant goes into the temple of dagon and as soon as it enters into the temple of Dagon, they go and leave it overnight and they find the next morning that the, that, the, that the idol has fallen right before the presence of God. And so they lift it up again to be like, okay, that's weird. They come back the next day and they find the idol completely destroyed. Literally, the, only the stub is left. The arms have been broken. The head has been broken off. And one of the things that God began to speak to me through that story He's like, Thimba, when I tell you to overcome the idols in your life, 
the way that you overcome them is not by going and being like, go away. I, it's actually literally through his presence in my life that the idols in my life will fall. The epicenter of everything is him. What Rahab did is that she made a decision to turn around. One of the things that I do, um, and why this is, this is something that I have come to learn and understand as I've gone on, is that when I struggle with something, when I am struggling, when I am struggling with sin, with temptation, with anything, I go to him. Unfortunately, for most of us, when we struggle, we run away from him. We turn away from him. But the reality is this, is that the transformation that I need, the real transformation that I need, comes from him. And it comes from me setting my gaze upon him. That God of Rahab, where she made a decision that I want to be with that guy, I want to be with your God, changed her life. And the same decision that you made, all those deficiencies that you see in your life, that your father has come with a whip. And I assure you, because the God of Rahab is our God, that every single thing that it is that you're struggling with, he literally comes in and he's like, I got you. I will transform you. And all we must do is exactly what Jesus said, that our work is to believe in the one in whom he sent. Jesus Christ is able to deliver you from anything that you're struggling with. Anything. And not only that, Jesus Christ is setting in motion this beautiful story around your life merely by a decision to turn around just like Rahab. That's the only thing we know that she did. And listen to the way her story is told. As a champion of faith, as a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, this woman's life literally transformed from being Rahab the prostitute to being Rahab, Jesus' show show. Just by a decision she made to literally turn and face the God of heaven and the God of earth. Amen? So, I think for me the thing that I just want to close with is just the fact that like, you know, I, I want to encourage anyone who has believed in Jesus that if, if you're struggling with some stuff, give glory to God. Because if you are not struggling with it, it means that Jesus is not in your temple. But what happens is this, is that when he comes into your temple, he literally comes with a whip. And you can imagine what that scene looked like. It must have been really uncomfortable for the disciples to watch Jesus going nuts. I mean, if you think about that scene, it's quite chaotic, actually. But it's exactly what he does in our lives. And there are times where you look and you're just like, my guy, I'm struggling with all these things. It's just like, yo, you just keep your eyes on the Savior. Because what's happening right now is transformation. The fact that you're uncomfortable about certain things that you've been so comfortable with for so long, that struggle that you've been battling and whatever, that you've been there gushanying with, it's like, give glory to God. Because it's an, it's an indication that your God, your Savior, your King, is in your temple, whipping things out of your life. And it's uncomfortable, but it is necessary. And it is his work in you. But on the flip side, if you are a person who does not know this God, this God of Rahab, right? I want to encourage you today to do what Rahab did and to choose the God of heaven and earth. Right? If you're interested in turning away from that life of just meaningless existence and you want to be like Rahab, Rahab the prostitute who then transforms into Rahab the champion of faith, a hero of faith. If you're interested in doing that, what you must do is believe in the one 
in whom he sent. God sent Jesus Christ, the scarlet thread. He is a scarlet thread because he shed his blood for you, that you may be able to experience a life of utter and complete transformation. And I pray that you would choose him as well, that you choose the scarlet thread that the spies, in fact, I feel like I'm the spy, coming to give you a scarlet thread that you may take it. And just like Rahab, who thought she was just saving her life from death, but did not realize that she was setting herself on a path of complete transformation because the God that we serve is not interested in using perfect people. He wants to use broken people and he wants to perfect them. If you're interested in making that decision, it's a very simple thing. I just need you to look at me and just say these words with me. Lord, I accept your message and I believe in the one that you sent. I believe in Jesus. Change my life and come in and transform my life. My friend, if you said those few words, this is really about turning your gaze towards him and you have done that just now. So you've begun the whole process of transformation in your life and I thank you because you now are set on a path similar to Rahab where God will begin to transform your life. I just want to now just pray for everybody else who's watching this. Um, Father, thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your love. Um, just want to exalt you today. Um, the God of Rahab, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Rahab. Father, we turn our gaze to you knowing that whatever it is that we're going through, that you, O King, are able to transform our lives, to change our narrative. And so, Father, we submit ourselves before you to seek you, to find you. You are our God. And so we come and we bring every single struggle that we have at your feet. And we will do this every day because you are the one who transforms us and you are the one who is going to change our lives and you are changing our lives. And so, Father, we just want to welcome your Holy Spirit into our lives that we may have wells of water just springing out of us. And so we welcome your Holy Spirit into our lives today. Do your thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for watching this. Please share this with someone that you love. And if you have any questions or you have any comments, you can reach me on social media or you can email me. Also, to support this ministry, click the link below. And also subscribe that you may be able to get regular updates on the videos that we drop. God bless you. I will trust you in this moment, even if you make me wait. Yeah, yeah. God, you are never late. I will trust you in this moment.